All right, good afternoon, everybody. So let me know if you can't hear me. I, uh, my my uh, wife tends to tell me that uh, I can't hear her, uh, but I'm going to try and speak out and, and project as much as possible. So what I'd like to do is, I, I actually have to be on my best behavior because I can see a lot of people in the audience that are actually smarter than me and, and folks in population health and stuff like that. I put this together as what I, I thought would be meaningful for, 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 for me as a, a family physician and also to patients. And, and, and Dave asked me to talk a little bit about closing care gaps because this is something that uh, we do all the time, every day in, in, in primary care. So I'd like to go into uh, the presentation and then if, if the video works, if Ian says the video is going to work, the video is going to work, okay? So It better work. Um, I just no learned that we here. have Kurt. Is it Kurt? No, Kurt. Okay, Harold. He, he was one of the inventors of the, the uh, panel support tool, or the patient support tool. So I, again, I have to be very careful with my, with my nomenclature here, uh, my naming and stuff like that. But a care gap, what I know about care gaps is that there's two main type of care gaps that we look at. One is what we call a preventative care gap. And you notice I kind of highlighted that a little bit and, and underlined it. And I'm going to focus on that a little bit more today. Those are the care gaps that are mostly based on like your age and your gender. So like if you were a 50 year old female, what I'm interested in are your mammogram, your pap smears, your fit test, which is your stool testing and things like that. Those are prevention. Immunizations are also considered prevention, so that that's considered a preventative care gap. And I'm going to show you a screenshot of what we see every day in the PST a little bit later. The therapeutic care gaps are actually a really cool tool. The therapeutic care gaps, I'm not going to go into a ton today, but that is actually, those are the gaps, uh, things that aid the clinician in making clinical decisions. So if Paula, I'm going to pick on Paula because she's in the front row here. If Paula came in to uh, a visit with me, let's say in December of uh, 2012, and her blood pressure was 141 over 92, at the next visit, if he came, she came to see me tomorrow, that thing might fire up and say, hey, her blood pressure at her last visit was 141 over 92, was above the 140 over 90 limit. Have you considered high blood pressure? All right, it helps prompt us to look at stuff like that. And it's a host of other things besides blood pressure. Trust me, there's a host of other things besides blood pressure. But I want to focus on preventative care gaps today. So why are closing care gaps important? And simply put, it saves lives, all right? And I know sometimes I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but I, I'm, I'm going to say that over again. It saves lives, it saves lives, and it saves lives. And a lot of my slides right here is going to say it saves lives. So I want to give a little disclaimer here. There's a lot of statistics and studies over out there, okay? And medical studies are really, really confusing, all right? And again, the bottom line is it saves lives. Now, I came across some statistics looking from my trusty friend, and I please, please close your ears, those uh, statistic experts from Google, all right? <laughs> and um, so I came across this, the number of women needed to be screened annually between age 40 and 84 to save one life from breast cancer, that's one premature life death, was just 84, all right? That's not a whole lot. And the number of women needed to screen annually between 40 and 84 to gain one extra year of life, 5.3. So just think about that for a little bit, right? Not only are you preventing death, but you're prolonging life. All right? So again, saves lives. Now, if you guys are interested in reading the whole article in your free time while you're exercising on your treadmill, <laughs> the references are all there. I can forward all this to you, all right? So this is, this is an example of that. This month, October, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. How many of you know that? That's awesome. You guys are like way ahead of the curve, okay? Breast Cancer Awareness Month. October 17th, for those of you who are above the age of 40 and you're thinking, ah, mammogram, no mammogram, okay? Think about October 17th because that is the day we are going to set a world record. We're going to be teaming up with uh, Southern California and other Kaiser regions, 
and we're going to try and do the most mammograms in one day. I don't know how we can't get it done, right? But the current record's 434 in San Diego. Oh, come on. We're going to crush it. But think about this, right? Next time when you're sitting down with your grandkids and you're, you know, telling them a bedtime story, you can say, Grandma was part of a world record. You don't have to tell them about what. But you can say, I'm part of a world record, right? And, and it's actually cold. So October 17, we're going to open up all our mammogram machines. We actually have a mobile unit roaming around town right now. How many of you have been to Rockwood lately? Okay, if you've been to Rockwood lately, you'll see that it's parked kind of off in the side there, and it is, it is, it is pumping, okay? I shouldn't say pumping, that's the wrong word. It is moving, it is moving, okay? So we're gonna open up all that on the 17th, and, and uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna cut down diagnostic studies on, the, on that day and, and, and uh, focus on screening tests. So if you wanna be part of a little record, think about it, all right? We'll get you, we'll, we'll get you going there. All right. You just show up, what is the... Well, you still want to try and call for an appointment, but uh, the uh, director of imaging, I've actually been bugging him a lot about that. I, I, I actually emailed him a few times. He's sick of me. It's like, oh, gosh, another email from this guy. Uh, they will not turn anybody away. So they'll work you in on the 17th. And I said, well, what about the 18th? <laughs> he didn't want to get into that. But on the, seven, on the 17th, you can actually walk in. They will take care of you on that day. All right. It saves lives part two, pap smears. All right, now I, I'm not trying to like, don't worry, we're gonna hit the men in a bit, okay? I know you're thinking, okay, mammograms, pap smears, and stuff like that. So um, when I started practice, which was not that long ago, uh, I won't tell you how long ago, the smear was on a slide, and then you kind of sprayed it with this kind of like ozone depleting thing, and, and there's a couple of holes up above Seattle and California, and that was the, that was the pap smear. That was, that was only about 20 years ago. Several years ago, we progressed to something called a liquid-based pap. There's no more sprays. For you to have pap smears, there's no more sprays in there. So we're, we're doing good there, and it's way, way more accurate. And when we were spraying, we had to do pap smears every year. Okay, how many of you like to do pap smears every year? No one's raising their hands. Now that we've gone to the liquid-based, What's happening is that with the evidence, we've, with, with the accuracy, we've been able to prolong that a little bit more, and you know that sometimes you can go every three years. A couple of years ago, we went to something called a co-test. Now we not only do the liquid-based PAP, but if you're at a certain age, we do something called a co-test where we actually test you for HPV, which can cause all right, uh, uh, cervical cancer. In the past, what would happen was that you would do a PAP smear, and then if it came back positive, we'll say, come on back, we'll do the HPV test on you. Now we just do it at the same time. And we're actually looking at studies right now to see whether we can, we even need it every three years. And, and I don't know all the details about it, but, but I think that with the, with the advancement, it, it's actually going to be even better. So, research, research, it saves lives. In some long-term observation studies over 20 years, the mortality rate in, in most industrialized nations, when I looked at this, was somewhere around 35 to 50 percent. That's mortality rate. So if you want to live long and have pap smears, go to Iceland. Okay, Iceland, because it's a more controlled group, they've actually been able to reduce mortality by 80 percent by doing pap smears. And this is actually uh, from the National Cancer Institute website which, by the way, has a little uh, disclaimer there due to the uh, shutdown. It may not be updated, so I, again, I disclaimer. I'm serious about that, okay? All right, so it saves lives. All right, I promised the guys that we would come to them. Women, you still have to do this, okay? All right, so colorectal screening, one of the most confusing things out there, all right? We've got the FIT test. We've got FOBD tests, we've got colonoscopy, we've got flexible sigmoidoscopy, we've got double contrast barium enema, we've got CT colonoscopy, we've got the camera pill. How many of you have heard about the camera pill? <laughs> okay, none of you want to do that, okay? <laughs> uh, it's where you kind of swallow a camera and it kind of goes around in, in your, in your uh, it was way too expensive. 
I'm going to make a declaration. Not everyone agrees with this. At Kaiser Permanente, there's been two winners. And the winners are the fit test and the colonoscopy. All right? And, and um, it just makes it a little less confusing. I believe that these are the best tests. My message to you guys today, if you're over the age of 50, just get one done. I don't care whether it's the fit test or the colonoscopy, but just get one done. All right, because it saves lives. All right, the FIT is recommended unless you have a significant family history of colorectal cancer, CRC's colorectal cancer. I'll have, be happy to give you the details, but I'm not gonna go into all the criteria at this point in time. Colonoscopies occur if any of the FIT tests come back positive. All right, so when you get a FIT test, if it comes back positive for hidden blood, Remember, it's looking for hidden blood. Well, the colonoscopy is the next step. <laughs> if you have a strong family history of, of, of uh, colon cancer, talk with your doctor. We may decide to go with the colonoscopy. And then remember my last statement. If you just have this burning desire to get a colonoscopy, get one done, okay? And here's why. So if, if in doubt, and you can't find good data in the United States, we go to Europe. So in the European Union, these were some really startling <coughs> examples, okay? They looked at some, some uh, mortality studies again. They looked at, at reduction in mortality about 50% when they looked over about an 11-year period or so from 1989 to 2010. Now, I'm not picking on Greece, okay? But I want you to take cl <laughs> close attention to this. So in Austria, 35% of males, we gotta hit, hit the males, right? had some kind of like a scope. And I'm not gonna tell you whether it's like a flex sig or a colonoscopy, but 35% of males had some kind of scope and 39% reduction in mortality. But if you went to Greece, those Greeks say, nah, the males especially, and I have some Greek patients, they don't necessarily want to be screened. I, hope, I don't want to insult anybody. 8% of the males only had endoscopic uh, uh, studies done. And guess what? There was a 30% increase in mortality. Mm -hmm. Question. So is this a, a decrease in mortality in CRC, or is this a decrease in mortality overall? CRC. Okay. That what I'm a, what, now, there's a lot of confounding factors on there because people die from other things when they have CRC as well, too. So I can't give you the exact details of... I mean, they were diagnosed at the time with CRC when, when they had a death, but I can't tell you whether they died from congestive heart failure or anything like that. So okay. I'm sorry I don't have that detail. Okay. But I thought that was a pretty start. Would you explain CRC? CRC is colorectal cancer, I'm sorry. Colorectal cancer. Any other quick questions about that? All right. All right, I, it's flu season. I can't help myself, all right? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Flu shots. So there's a pretty cool video. How many of you have seen the cool video by uh, Joe Kane? Okay, that is a really cool video. If you haven't checked it out, okay, just hit the home page button and wait wait for Dr. Kane. How many of you know who, what Dr. Kane looks like? Uh, who Dr. Kane looks like? <laughs> Click on that, you'll be able to see the flu video. I'm just giving you some facts from that, all right? 220,000 people will be hospitalized with the flu this year, all right? 36,000 will die. No, you cannot get the flu from the flu shot, although my patients insist that they still can. <laughs> and yes, this is, this, is the, this is the key point here. Yes, even if you are healthy and never get the flu, you need to get the flu shot. And here's the reason why. If you listen to Dr. Caden, he's spot on. You guys right here in this room, you are the reservoirs, all right? And what happens is that the people that are are old or young, they don't move around. You guys are the ones that are going on vacations, going into airports and things like that. You guys are carrying the flu. And you, when you carry the flu, you carry it to the next, next uh, group of people. You may, you may visit some grandkids, you may visit some nieces and nephews, and boom, they get it. They're the ones of the 220,000 folks that will end up in the hospital. So please get your flu shot. 
The effectiveness, this was actually from the CDC website. Again, government shutdown says that it may not be completely up to date. Um, for those who get a flu vaccine, they're about 60% less likely to visit a doctor with new influenza-like illness. And the flu clinics are going on in the medical offices now. Until when? Until the end of next week. All right, I wanted to show you um, the Kaiser Permanente Advantage here. And I'm very passionate about this. It's one of the reasons why I work in this organization, the panel support tool. Um, and, and Jeff Weiss wants to rename it the patient support tool. It's still the PFT, so that we don't have to change a bunch of the uh, uh, acronyms. I'm gonna show you the next screenshot that will show you the, an example of the therapeutic and preventative care gap and it's an awesome tool and it's unique to this organization all right and it serves as a guide and again the recurrent theme is that it helps save lives so this is what we i look at every single day with every patient that i see this is actually a real patient i think i've blotted out all the possible things over here here's an example of a therapeutic care gap right here and what this tells us is that based on this patient's history it actually tells me what this patient's cardiac risk is over the next 10 years. And as you can see, it's about 11%. The PST says, you know what, you really should think about putting that patient on aspirin because we know aspirin will reduce that mortality rate. Wow. So that's an example of a therapeutic care gap. So this preventative care gap, I need to see this patient prompto. Okay. And by the way, you can see the 10, right? It's like golf. The lower the number, the better. All right. So the pre preventative care gap, we got to get a flu shot done on her, we got to get a Tdap done of her, which includes pertussis, all right, we got to do a pneumovax on her because she's a smoker or, or may have asthma, there's a mammogram that's due, she's due for a fit test or a colonoscopy, there, there you go, she's a smoker, oh my goodness, right? Now she may come in for like back pain, but if she comes in for back pain, I'm going to hit her for all of this, <laughs> for all I can. And if I can't get all of this done with her today, I will start bargaining with her. Okay, I'll take care of your back pain. You want meds? You're going to get flu shot. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to take care of everything, all right? And here's another preventative care gap here. Here's that co-test. She's also due for a pap smear. All right? So this is an example of... of uh, what we see every day it's a it's a pretty pretty cool tool and um, it's one of those things that it's sometimes my best friend but sometimes uh, when you have so many things to address it becomes a, an interesting visit you know and and I'm sure you've heard from some of your doctors it's like how can I possibly do this in 20 minutes it's 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 pretty tough but it's the right thing to do and what's unique and it saves lives all right any questions about this all right, I'm going to go to my last slide here. So there's an ERCAD gap, right? There's a care gap that you can do outside of the medical office. Every single care gap that we talked about in here so far, you actually have to come in, get a mammogram, pap smear. I guess you can do the fit test at home, but you still got to, you know, you still got to send it in. So um, outside of the medical office, I'm going to try this out and see whether it'll work or not. I'm just gonna see whether we can call this up here. Mm -hmm. I'll let you listen to it. How many of you have heard this 23 and a half hour day? So there's only a couple of free people? Okay, so let me see whether I can play it. Ian promised me that it'll work. It'll work. <laughs> I have faith in you, Ian. I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and I'm presenting this visual and Dr. lecture called 23 and a half hours in partnership with 24 Hour Fitness. It's great to be working with people who have a passion for helping others achieve their individual fitness goals and promoting positive change in their lives. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, but weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all of these things are incredibly important, and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What has the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? Um, so I did my research, and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked up this intervention, and 
because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems, and that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list, so this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue and of course the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better and this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is what's uh, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons and, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm... Um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day so there's 24 hours and so you might spend most of your day you know this varies obviously but uh, you know couch surfing sitting at work obviously sleeping and what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active maybe an hour and that uh, if you can do that you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides so if exercise is a medicine what's the dose so when I think of, of, of dose I think of how long how often and how intense I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message but essentially uh, more activity is better but I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day so if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more if you're a kid, an hour a day if you're a kid, my fly goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that, um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush. Uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something. And after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, women who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down. So it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. If you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise, so it can be broken into three. If you're only going to do it if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve the 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs and so on and so forth. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm going to finish by asking you a question, and this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. but. Um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So, whether it's hitting the gym and attaining fitness goals, or walking the dog, or taking the stairs, get out there and be active. Thanks again to 24 Hour Fitness for bringing you this message. So that um, ends my portion of this is just a heads up to let you know that you guys can control those care gaps every single day outside of the medical office or inside of the medical office. Um, but um, uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them or if other people know, um, want to comment on, on the presentation, be happy to hear. Anything else? What are some new care gaps that are coming out? <laughs> well, um, there's other HEDIS measures out there that, that keep popping up. There's also a lot of therapeutic care gaps that are So one of the major therapeutic care gaps that are coming up are for depression screening. That's probably going to be out there. We also have a lot on, on uh, opiate therapy plans and things like that. 
And again, um, you saw how ominous that list is sometimes. We have to be a little bit careful about uh, what we actually put on, on a PST because it's, it's sort of like there was an interesting statement that, that uh, was made and one of the things is that the question is that after you hit a certain amount of uh, exercise, they're not 100% sure whether that's beneficial. And I've known patients that are addicted to exercises, exercise as well too, too much of a good thing, all right? So PST to me is sort of like exercise. If you get it just right, it's really good. But too much of a good thing, we just have to kind of gate it a little bit once in a while. No offense, but we just have to gate it around a little bit, okay? So there's more stuff coming on, but we'll need to be careful about I'm that. I'm hearing something about the BMI care gap. The, the <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> All right, go ahead. go ahead. So today, we deployed a pilot at North Lancaster and East Interstate. And for a while, we're going to test a BMI care gap. So senior leadership has said that we needed a care gap such that any time somebody's body mass index, which you can look up on the web to calculate if you want, is uh, greater than or equal to 30, then the care gap fires and a message, uh, it needs to be given, it's short stories, a message needs to be given to the patient. So there's messaging that, that goes out to the patient. So it's the first step in this sort of way that we're trying to address this. So actually the first step hey, was exercise is a vital sign where everybody gets their yeah. uh, minutes, uh, days per week, minutes per day of exercise to get every time you have an office visit in primary care, most of specialty oh, care. Now we're going to hopefully after. deploy this care gap regionally uh, later on in the fall or early winter. And it's it's part of a, a package of things we're doing to address yes. the idea of fitness. I don't know. Let me put you on the spot. So if I would tell you that this group in general, uh, about 100% know or have closed their care gaps, okay. and about 100% have taken the THA through this incentive wellness model that we've created that we think is the right approach, because it's what we're asking our patients to do. But we've also done a couple little nefarious things, like asked some questions on the last two physicians' work-life surveys. And we also have one sort of component that, because we've been doing this program in the dental dentist group. And the interesting things are that um, it, it, the physicians, only 53% said they knew their care gaps or were interested in knowing them. Uh, the rest were not interested. And in terms of the THA, Dave, I think it was only 40% had taken a THA. Mm -hmm. And the THA uh, was consistent with what the dentist said, that they weren't really interested. Now, the dentist care gap closure or knowing their care gaps was really high. Why do you, why do you think that is? Because we're trying to sort of work with our physician health and work life committee to how do we, um, you know, what is physician health and wellness, and I don't mean work-life balance and all that stuff. What because, you, what? because physicians make the worst patients. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna lay it on the line. We, we absolutely make the, we make the worst patients. I mean, we tend to wait longer to go, to go in to see a doctor. We tend to, we tend to, and I'm pointing to myself, come in working sick, which is not always all that great. Um, and and we're not, we're not good at this, and we need to change that. So, um, listening to what you said, I'm going to kind of weave this in a little bit here. We have 100% participation here, and the TH, THA and, and the care gaps are all zero. Start challenging your group, and this is where we as physicians, the people that do know their care gaps, and the people that did complete a THA, which I can actually raise my hand and say I did that, challenge folks and say, my care gap is zero, what's yours? We did that at the division clinic. Okay, and our little module, it was on Scout's Honor, don't go into anybody's medical record and <laughs> care gap, okay? Please, don't do that. Otherwise, I'm going to have to call Rashad, okay? Um, but it's on Scout's Honor. My care gap is zero. What's yours? And if you don't know what your care gap is, it's very easy to look it up on kp.org. You don't even have to look it up in Health Connect. And that's where the challenge started, and, and, and it's interesting, when we raised that challenge, 
in my module, one of the female providers said, oh my gosh, I got to go get my pap smear done. Okay? And she offered it up. I didn't, I didn't say, oh my goodness, you know, you're due for a pap smear, so I got to go get my pap smear done. And she actually came back to another huddle and said, okay, it's zero. <laughs> and then when we got that done, we brought it to our whole module meeting and we asked them, I'll carry a gap to zero, what's yours to the internal medicine module upstairs when we were downstairs. So the same thing, in your work groups, okay, you can just ask that question. You know, my, my, my THA completion rate in our little pod here is 100%, what's yours? And I think that's the challenge. But to answer your question, Rich, we're, we're the worst patients, and, and we got to do better at it. We should be at 100% flu vaccination, but we're not. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Unless you have an allergy, doctors should be 100% uh, immunized. I, I think that we need to be 100% immunized as, a, as an organization, but physicians should not be like, I think I'm going to get a flu from the flu vaccine. And I still hear that. All right? Yes? I have a question. I mean, uh, I can see when you showed your slide of um, that one particular patient with all their care gaps, mm -hmm. uh, my, my PCP I, is an avid user of the uh, PST. I see her questions come in on the contact desk often. But I went to another physician the other day, and um, he asked me what I did, and I told him I work on the PST, and he was like, oh, the PST. And that is not the first time I've talked to a physician that has really loathed the PST. Do you know, do you know why they might just like using the PST? Yeah, and, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, PST on some days can be your best friend, but some, on some days it can be uh, uh, very difficult and a challenge. So what I've learned in, in any type of medical practice is that some days are, are just, you're just humming along, and some days you're just an hour behind. And I know all of you guys feel that way as well too, and when all heck is breaking loose, you just can't keep up. So. When I'm running about an hour behind and I'm doing service recovery with every single patient after three o'clock and I look up that care gap thing, what am, what am I, I, I'm gonna have a few choice words to say and, and, and what I'll say is screw it, okay? I mean, this thing is wrecking my work life, I can't do this and all that stuff. And what I'll tell you is that it is an advantage and with every advantage, if you have, again, too much in it, we just have to be more careful about what we apply to the PST. But on the whole, if you ask people across the board, when I interview physicians, I, I used to interview a lot more physicians, I would actually sit down and show them the PST, and they'd be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you guys have this. So it's a great recruitment tool until they get here, <laughs> right? But, but it is very much appreciated because it gives, me, it gives me the ability to close the gaps. And this is truly one of the reasons why we were number two in the NCQA ranking for commercial and number three in Medicare. I personally don't think we could have gotten there without the PST. You can't do it by one of those, you know, like searching for wells, you know, with those sticks and saying, I think you're due for a pap smear. Can't do that. You got to have something that shows us that. So it's a fine balance, just like everything else. But I think the PST is not going anywhere. Okay, we just have to manage it a little bit better. Does that help a little bit? Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we close up? Keep you over. Keep you out of Urban's mentioned a second ago. Does everybody know about personal action plan? Yeah, so so kp.org is like this phenomenal research, right? Uh, resource out there. You can find out your care gaps, you can find out, do a personal action plan, uh, you can go into self modules where you can actually. I, I recently did a back pain module on my own. I took out my back and so I was like looking through it and stuff. It's a phenomenal research, a resource for, for folks, but there's a personal action plan that you can take. Like for example, if you have care gaps, you can, you can plan it out when to close it and things like that. So that's another resource if you like reminders and things like that as well too. Thank you for that reminder. All right, everyone, thank you for your attention. And, uh,